the second uh, major news event to discuss today is the fact that Chelsea Manning has been subpoenaed. And we have um, a quote from the New York Times who wrote on the subject saying, uh, quote, Chelsea Manning, the former army intelligence analyst convicted in 2013 of leaking archives of secret military and diplomatic documents to WikiLeaks, revealed in an interview that she had been subpoenaed to testify before a grand jur jury and vowed to fight it. The subpoena does not say what prosecutors intend to ask her about, but it was issued in the Eastern District of Virginia and comes after prosecutors inadvertently disclosed in November that Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, has been charged under seal in that district. Ms. Manning, who provided a copy of the subpoena to the New York Times, said that her legal team would file a motion on Friday to quash it arguing that it would violate her constitutional rights to force her to appear. She declined to say whether she would cooperate if that failed. So I feel that this narrative is being blown up to this degree right now, in my opinion, because it helps to distract the public from Julian Assange being prosecuted and persecuted because of the Manning era emails. I really strongly feel that, for example, the um, the really fake Guardian story about Manafort, you know, visiting Assange, and that never happened. There was no evidence for that, but, the, uh, but that came out very shortly after um, the the sealed charges against Assange were inadvertently confirmed. Like that was that really came on the back of that. So I think that, in my opinion, a lot of this is coming from not not just uh, uh, the motivation of, of vilifying Trump and trying to create collusion out of nowhere, but also from distracting from the real reason that Julian Assange is being pr uh, prosecuted and persecuted. Well, it's uh, yes. Uh, the WikiLeaks lawyers have been saying since a long time that there was this indictment sealed in the Eastern District of Virginia in Alexandria, Virginia, where I live 10 minutes away by car, I often uh, remark. Um, I've been in that courtroom for that first hearing about whether to unseal this indictment or not. And uh, it was based on, on the 2010, the uh, Afghan cables and the collateral damage video. Why would they want to speak to Manning? It's really interesting because nobody from Mueller's office, and he's winding up his investigation, has spoken to anyone at WikiLeaks. And they can't tell you that you don't know where Julian Assange is <laughs> and that he could, uh, you know, can't be found. We have Bella Magnani on Twitter saying it's not speculation what DOJ wants uh, Chelsea Manning to testify about. She says, if you look at the top right hand corner of the grand jury subpoena, you'll see 10GJ3793. That's the WikiLeaks case number targeting the quote founders, owners or managers of WikiLeaks. So thank you, Bella, for that tweet. That's really informative. So I've been working on this piece about Espionage Act and Julian Assange. And the unfortunate fact is that the way it's written, and based on some amendments in 1961, that anyone in the world, that the, it's a global treaty now, but it was originally 1917, only for somebody who uh, leaked classified information on US territory, now it's anywhere in the world. And mere possession or dissemination uh, by a journalist or a publisher is liable to be prosecuted. It's a draconian, horrible act. But it's the fact, and it has happened before, I'm discovering there was a publication called The Masses back in 1918 that their editors were prosecuted on the Espionage Act for certain publications that ran afoul of the U.S. government during a time of war. Uh, but they were worried that if Assange is prosecuted, that that opens up all news organizations who also publish classified information, who can be charged under the Espionage Act. And technically, it's there. They backed off, and they didn't go forward with that because they said, it, they called it the New York Times problem. If they prosecute WikiLeaks and Assange, you know, people are going to say, well, the New York Times is getting away with it. Why don't you prosecute them? Uh, so they backed off. But I worry that the Trump administration, who hates the media more than anybody, and a lot of his criticisms are accurate, but many of them aren't, and he's certainly anti-media, and uh, maybe he would go after the New York Times. Maybe that's the idea. You know, maybe get the song. New York Times would wake up to the issue. You know, it's ridiculous they haven't already. So I think, yeah, I mean, I know that their lawyer has, has stated that they would be liable, as you mentioned, but I, I, it seems that the, the culture of the New York Times and the uh, the opinion, the opinions and, and news that they publish still seems to be blind to that fact, despite their own lawyers, you know, basically admitting that they would be liable. 
What was he supposed to do? Say, oh, I got all these Democratic emails, but you know what? It could affect the outcome, so we're going to sit on it. Now, and it doesn't matter who the source is. It's the, what matters is whether the news is accurate or not. Because exactly. every source tells, has it, everybody, uh, every source to a journalist has a motive for going forward and telling a journalist something, leaking something. And that's important, the motivation, particularly when we're dealing with oral statements from a source saying, I, this and this and that, you got to check that out. But when you have the documents in front of you and you can verify that they're real. What news outlet can- wouldn't have published them? What, I mean, really, forget WikiLeaks a moment. If, if the New York Times had been handed these documents, do you think for a moment that they would not have published them? I mean, it would be scary if they wouldn't have. Well, I, you know, it's an interesting question because I'd like to think, of course, that they would. But in the environment that we're living in now with the media, uh, they look, they may have sat on it. Now, Maybe. They did that. They did that with the, uh, the James Risen story. Risen had information about wireless wiretap. Total violation of the Fourth Amendment and the Bush administration. And the New York Times uh, top echelon there, including the publisher, was put under a lot of pressure from the Bush administration not to publish this story. And they didn't. They waited till after the election. This was Bush's second term election. So they withheld information that would have had an impact on the voter, even for a Republican candidate. That is mind blowing. And what happened was that Risen was coming out with his book after the election, in which he was going to reveal all this. So he was going to scoop his own newspaper. So then they decided, well, we'd have to publish it. And all hell broke loose. And they tried to blame Tom Drake for being the source for that. He wasn't. Uh, But so there's an example where they did withhold a major story that had a huge impact on the American public. This is the very essence of the role of the media, what it should be which is defend the interests of the public, defend the governed, not the governors, as Hugo Black said in his famous Pentagon Papers uh, written opinion. That's the reason the press has freedom under the First Amendment is to protect the public from their government. And the New York Times had a major story saying that the government, whether Republican or Democrat, was spying on Americans without a warrant using 9-11 as the excuse. And they sat on that story because it could affect the election. And uh, so I would think that in this environment now, if they only the New York Times were given these emails about Hillary Clinton, then maybe they wouldn't have published it. Why should we give them the benefit of the doubt, Elizabeth, after all that we've seen, the way the corporate media uh, uh, operates? Would they, would CNN have talked about these emails? Yeah, I think that definitely there's no reason to give them the the benefit of the doubt at this. On one level, you have the the ruling class being exposed, you know, in a very um, tangible sense, their secrets and machinations are revealed to the public. But in a secondary sense, the the way in which the you know media is doing a terrible job is also exposed in a in a more indirect way. And so I think both of those elements come together to create the real sense of not just prosecution legally, but persecution of, the, of, of Assange and WikiLeaks on the part of the entire establishment kind of class. It seems to me, as an American speaking now, that uh, the media in Australia just has parroted the same thing that the American media did, that they also published WikiLeaks stuff at the beginning. Uh, and now he's become persona non grata. Uh, and I, that is very troubling to me. Um, if I were an imperialist, uh, I would be proud that the United States is able to determine the political views and even the culture, the political culture of other countries. But as, uh, but I'm not an imperialist, so I'm disturbed that the U.S. has this kind of reach. And, and you, as an Australian, um, where is the sovereignty of Australia? Why can't they, especially about one of their own citizens? Well, I think um, fellow Australian Caitlin Johnstone actually, uh, I believe it was a year or two ago, wrote a fantastic article where she basically referred to Australia as the United States' basement gimp. (laughs) So I think her her assessment of Australian sovereignty was really spot on. I think that it's it's not just on issues like Julian Assange. I mean, we know in the first, um, in the second Iraq war, the lead up to it, you had, you know, John Howard along with Tony Blair, you know, following the the lead of George, uh, of Bush and his administration and their kind of drumbeat 
um, in the in the escalation that led to that war. I think that this is yet another issue where Australian sovereignty really just goes out the window. There's no independent, um, you know, foreign policy and and view. It's it's really obvious that, uh, you know, maybe you know in, in the in the wake of the fading of the the power of the British Empire, Australia is almost, um, you know, in real terms, almost a you know a colony of United States imperialism. And I think that's the evidence we have of that is is. Uh, in in policy towards people like Assange, and you know the foreign policy supporting these wars, these imperialist wars. So it's very unfortunate. I believe um, the Australian government passed a law, if I'm remembering correctly. And chat if I'm if I'm making a mistake, please correct me. But I think that they passed a law wherein journalists could actually be prosecuted simply for discussing um, classified material or you know illegally gotten material. It was like a, a very very anti press freedom um, law that was passed, if I'm remembering that right. Um, and so I think that that, again, it's it's almost as if, you know, Australia in some ways is, is even worse in some matters than the United States is. And I think that that's really troubling as well. And even more reason for people to go and, and get into the streets and, and support Julian Assange, um, who has, you know, fundamentally changed the face of journalism from the ground up. Could you tell, tell us a little bit more about that? I'm not, I'm not aware of this. After the establishment turned against Assange and WikiLeaks, Australia passed a law saying that it was illegal for the press to discuss classified matter internally, not even publishing it, just to possess it. No, I believe it was, um, yeah, to publish on it. Not, I don't know about the possessing it part, but I believe to discuss it. Yeah, that sounds awful like, an awful lot like the Espionage Act in the United States, that the media cannot receive uh, classified information. Uh, they cannot even hold it. They are not authorized to receive it. So uh, it's not just the person leaking it, the whistleblower, but the journalists and the publishers can be liable for prosecution. I've got a comment saying, yeah, it was actually passed much more recently. It was in 2017 or 2018. And I've got an article here from um, ABC in Australia, basically discussing that it says journalists could face 10 years in jail for exposing security agency quote, bungles. So I think that that is absolutely astounding that it was actually passed. Um, it was legislation that did go through the Australian government. So I think I would just say that I think that that type of draconian law is, is just more reason that, pe that people in Australia should be infuriated at their government and really uh, go out and stand in support of Julian Assange. So. State owned uh, news agencies around the world and that we, we are free because we're owned by some big plutocrat. But in fact, this law would shut up the press from saying anything. And in New Zealand, there was something even worse where uh, it became legal to spy on New Zealand citizens. Exactly. Uh, and I'm also, I'm also seeing a comment here from the Sydney, and a quote from the Sydney Morning Herald um, uh, on the Australian tax office whistleblower who is now facing 161 years in prison for exposing misconduct by the ATO, and they will not be protected. Uh, they will not be protected by new laws passed by the parliament designed to shield whistleblowers uh, against the Australian government. So basically, although this is not a journalist, we're having, um, it looks like there is an Australian whistleblower who is now facing like multiple life sentences in regards to this type of draconian law. The new, it says the new whistleblower protections only apply to corporations, not government employees, living whistleblowers exposed. The, he faces as I said earlier, he faces six life sentences, which um, this quote says was more than three times that of the of Burke Street mass murderer James uh, Gargasolis. But basically, yeah, I mean, we see people being punished to such an insane degree where we have, you know, murderers and violent offenders going, you know, with maybe five years in prison, you know, really ridiculously low sentences. It's, it's, it shows what our governments and ruling classes priorities are. In my opinion, I would not trust the Australian government to keep Assange safe if he was to return to Australia. I think that it would be very concerning as to, you know, the, the, I think that the, the Australian government would be just as likely as the UK government would be uh, to hand him over to the US via extradition. And I think it's definitely something to be worried about. But they, uh, you would have to go through the courts in Australia. Right. You might, right. If there's a judge who would not agree, that's Oops. the only thing that could be. Where some people in earlier uh, originals have said that they he, they don't even think he'd get this 
uh, legal process in the UK that he could be immediately put on a plane. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that that's the case. It seemed like he would have to have a, a judicial process. But there's not such a law. There is Official Secrets Act in Britain. Uh, but, but this is uh, an interesting development uh, that I didn't know about, this, this new law in Australia, uh, and how that could, could have been inspired, A, by WikiLeaks, and be intended for Julian if he should show up again on Australian territory. I mean, the thing just keeps closing in on him, doesn't it? From Absolutely. all sides. It's really chilling to watch that and to con consider that that could have been part of the motivation for passing that law. Definitely. Now, wasn't there, was there any outcry from the media in Australia about this law when it was being debated? Yeah. The only reason that I knew about it was because I saw WikiLeaks and, and related um, you know accounts on social media that support WikiLeaks tweeting, you know, you know, very, um, you know, consistently about the fact that this was ridiculous and horrendous and a danger to all press freedoms, not just Australia, not just, um, you know, WikiLeaks or WikiLeaks related press freedoms, but all, all journalists should be up in arms about that type of mid type of law. Well, what were all journal? Well, where was the Fairfax and Murdoch press on this? Did they, this directly affects them. I mean, to my knowledge, they were mostly silent on it, to my knowledge. As I said, the only reason I found out about it was because I follow WikiLeaks and, and that type of, you know, their social media accounts were very, um, you know, they were, they raised their voices about it. And obviously, if I was only listening to establishment media, I never would have heard about it, of course. Well, can there be an even more greater indictment against the corporate media that, that they didn't even defend their own interests? Exactly. That they're part and parcel of the state? I mean, it's just, um, of course, ABC probably said nothing as well. So that is just, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm blown, blown away by all this. Uh, yeah, it's stunning. It really is. By publishing classified information that what did what reveal crimes by the U.S. government and who gets punished, the people who reveal the crimes, whether that be the whistleblower or perhaps the publisher. 